All right. Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the uh, American Institute for Philosophical and Cultural Thought. My name is John Shook, and I'm the president. We have the other two directors of the Institute here with us, Randall Oxier and Larry Hickman. Welcome. Good to see you. Uh, the American Institute for Philosophical and Cultural Thought uh, fosters the study of philosophical and cultural thought in America, and uh, we collect. This is an archive and a library. We provide access to these resources to all sorts of visiting researchers, both domestic from here in America and international around the world. Uh, we have approximately 25 to 30,000 books, we're not clear, uh, under this one roof, and uh, collections of papers as well. And uh, we can host workshops and seminars like this one tonight fairly frequently. Uh, this space is also available for various kinds of receptions and musical events and other sorts of events of interest to the community and the academic community nearby at the Southern Illinois University at Carbondale. We also have a resident fellowship program. Do we have any fellows here with us well, presently? Paul Cherlin, <laughs> Myron Jackson is here with us, so good to see you folks. Uh, we believe that this institute has opened and is operating at a crucial time for humanities in America. Uh, there is a growing neglect for the humanities across institutions of higher education in America. And there is a, a widespread tendency, we worry, uh, to neglect uh, humanistic learning in our culture. And uh, we fear that it's getting worse and worsening. So we are in defiance of that uh, pessimism here. This is a, an act of bold optimism. And uh, so we decided to create a home uh, a community for humanistic thinking and learning, and we are devoted to conserving and conveying that treasure of, of inherited values and achievements on into the future. So we're glad to have you here, and uh, we regard uh, events such as these as a very good sign that there remains to be continued interest in uh, humanistic thought, philosophical thought, and American culture. Uh, it, it, it is still alive and well, and uh, we can treasure it and pass it on. So the next person who is going to speak is Randall Oxier, who will do some further introductions. Thank you very much for being here. This is a cookie. This cookie was paid for by the Foundation for the Philosophy of Creativity. In addition to this cookie, however, the Foundation for the Philosophy of Creativity has sponsored this spring conference for um, uh, creativity, and in particular this year's spring conference, this is the first year, we're going to do it for at least three years, but possibly beyond that, um, was creativity, pragmatism, uh, and logic. And so we've had uh, an afternoon of uh, papers on the topics of creativity, pragmatism, and logic, and the Central S Society for the Philosophy of Creativity, which is being restarted as of this evening with this ceremonial cookie um, uh, is, is, is going to be having a spring conference every year here. The Foundation for the Philosophy of Creativity has partnered with the AIPCT um, for lots of different programming including a summer dissertation fellowship. The first one was this past year. We've got another one uh, coming up this summer. Uh, and that has been a very successful program. The Han Lectures, the fourth of which was this past summer, and the fifth one will be this next summer. Ken Stickers will be our Han Lecturer, and I look forward to a full day of activities associated with that. And on into the future, the Foundation for the Philosophy of Creativity intends to interact with AIPCT and to promote the study of creativity, especially the philosophical study of creativity. Foundation for the Philosophy of Creativity and its associated societies, Pacific Division, Eastern Division, this one, was started in 1957 by William S. Minor, who was a professor of communication studies at SIU, a rhetoric professor essentially, but the philosophy of communication was his specialty. And those societies have carried out important research and have facilitated important research now for 
62 years. And so uh, we intend to continue that and we intend to continue it here. And so it's natural given that the, these foundation, the foundation and these societies were started at SIU Carbondale that they should continue to be based here and continue to do their programming okay. here. So, all right, so we have here Dr. Paul Sherlin presenting um, a essay called The Metaphysical Grounding of Logical Operations. Dr. Sherlin, Sherlin is now at Minneapolis College, once known as Minneapolis Community and Technical College. Um, he received his PhD in 2017 over down the road at SIU. And his interests, from what I know uh, from having glanced at a couple of his essays and presentations, are on metaphysics, John Dewey, um, creativity, and I've uh, appreciated reading some of them because they're nice, uh, at least the ones I've read, well-focused interpretive looks at the fundamental principles, usually metaphysical principles of these thinkers. So hand it over to Dr. Trillin. Okay, well, thanks for coming, and uh, it's nice to be back in the area, and it's uh, especially nice to be invited to talk here at the Institute. So I'll jump right in. Dewey's metaphysics, broad in scope, provides a general theory of the basic features of existence. In contrast, Dewey's logic, at first glance, seems to be confined to a context-driven instrumentalism. The prima facie discordance between these theories can, in fact, be harmonized through a careful examination of Dewey and qualities, which on my reading provide the bases for continuity in both the logical and metaphysical senses of the term. In addition to providing a common ground for the metaphysical and logical components of Dewey's philosophical program, a detailed study of qualities further reveals just what Dewey means by calling a trait generic to existence, and how the results of logical enterprise range beyond what might be called a humble fallibilism, so often associated with pragmatist thought more generally. Dewey wrote that qualities are, quote, the background, the point of departure, and the regulative principle of all thinking. Despite the massive explanatory burden that is placed upon qualitative relations, Dewey never offers a systematic and comprehensive explanation of the term. The difficult work to be done by Dewey's interpreters is compounded by a number of additional factors. The meaning of quality has no substantial resemblance to its older uses in philosophy. His statements concerning qualities are possibly contradictory. He even calls qualities ineffable, suggesting that they are beyond our capacity to describe or understand. And finally, he never develops and pushes the set of ideas associated with quality to their ultimate logical and ontological conclusions. Due in part to the above difficulties, Dewey and qualities, even when mentioned in the secondary literature, are seldom given detailed attention. Looking back at the four decades or so of scholarship, we can pick out just a handful of critical accounts. Much more remains to be said about the most general features of qualities, their function in providing the grounds for logical association, and their possible status as generic traits of existence. It is my hope to bring these neglected yet central features of qualities to light. Dewey himself acknowledged that he only addressed, quote, the fringes of a complex subject. To invoke a familiar phrase from Perke Avot, it is not incumbent upon you to finish the task, but neither are you free to absolve yourself from it. The easiest point of entry into the complex topic of qualities is through Dewey's logical theory, alternatively called his theory of inquiry. We might loosely divide his logical theory into three component parts or themes. One, the non-intellectual grounds for inquiry. Two, the pattern or process of inquiry itself. And three, methodological concerns, namely ways in which we can revise or rethink old logical tropes and execute inquiry in an effective way. The bulk of Dewey's masterwork on this topic, his 1938 logic, concerns the second and third of the above thematic features. There he goes into great detail about the structure of inquiry, different types of propositions, and the nature of judgment, the biological, cultural, and qualitative grounds of inquiry, which must be located beyond inquiry itself, are in comparison given much less detailed treatment addressed in piecemeal fashion in the opening chapters. The reasons for this are manifold, and I suspect that Dewey did not want his logic, a book that is purportedly not a work on metaphysics. In fact, he generally uses the word metaphysics in a sort of pejorative uh, sense in that book. So it's not meant to be a work on metaphysics, and he didn't want it to delve too far into territory that is apart from the very specific modes of reflective behavior to which the name inquiry can be given. 
Eight years earlier, in 1930, which is during the course of working on his logic, Dewey published Qualitative Thought, a difficult yet illuminating article that might be summed up as a response to a single question. What are the grounds for association in thought? Association as a pre-reflective ground is the central concern, and it only hinders the investigation if we begin with ideas expressed by Dewey himself, that individual things, people, places, works of art, have unique qualities, and that general phenomena, such as the color red or the sensation of sweetness, are also qualities. The non-cognitive grounds of association deserve first consideration, for the moment putting aside the status of particular reflective determinations. To begin to identify these grounds, it must be acknowledged that the capacity to distinguish and associate the objects of reflective thought cannot itself be a product of reflection. There is something more general in the background, something that is present and, quote, prior and independent of reflective analysis that makes possible a coherent process of active thinking, some sort of field that binds together that which is only divisible through reflection. To this phenomenon, Dewey gives the name quality. In qualitative thought, as well as in his logic, Dewey only discusses qualities as they function within what he terms situations. Dewey writes that any given situation, which is a living context for reflective thought and thus the basis upon which to build a theory of inquiry, is a whole in virtue of its immediately pervasive quality. While functioning as that which ties together particular situations, a quality cannot be a reflective determination. Rather, every aspect of the situation that has the potential to be reflectively abstracted is conjoined by and through a qualitative matrix. And it is this conjoinment, this unity and effective force, that provides that potential. To be more specific, qualities, at least as they function within a situation, have two primary and closely interrelated operations that jointly provide the grounds for purposive association. First, qualities cohere or more accurately, they comprise the underlying coherence of a situation. As situated, it is equally correct to say that qualities entail coherence among potential objects in continuity with inquiring subjects. Second, they suggest syntheses and divisions between or among objects, identities of individual things, and ultimately judgments about those things. To be clear, these two features of, or functionalities of qualities uh, coherence and what, I've, what I'll call suggestivity are ultimately inseparable. I distinguish them for the purposes of analysis. I will begin my investigation with the former. Qualitative coherence is grounded in what Dewey terms a serial relation, and this type of relation must be distinguished from a succession. In Dewey's vocabulary, a succession is an event that is direct, physical, and causally efficacious, or at least in the sense in the rough sense of an efficient cause. Successions are the objects of the specialized sciences. To identify a chemical composition or to posit a physical law is to say something about how things will physically interact under specific uh, conditions. In contrast to successions, serial relations have little to do with physical contiguity. A series is a process comprising a jointly purposive set of events whose origins and locations may be distant in space and time. This includes connections among ideas, feelings, materials, cultures, and histories. Pers purposiveness, a confluent coordinated movement towards some consummation, may be treated as a central aspect of a series. Events that are serially and thus purposively conjoined are the basis for experienced meaning and significance in the sense of providing a sign function that is instrumental for reflective thought. Coherence must be purposive, at least in the most general sense of the term. Dewey remarks that a quality, quote, buzzes to some effect, it blooms towards some fruitage. That is, the quality, although dumb, has a part of its complex quality, a movement or transition in some direction. It can, therefore, be intellectually symbolized and converted into an object of thought. Purpose is pre-reflective and is further refined and modified through inquiry. These purposive relations are the very bases for organic processes insofar as all life includes purpose in the above sense and anticipations that occur in coordination with potential states of affairs. Logical operations grow out of disturbances in more pervasive, serially conjoined organic processes. 
In his logic, Dewey states that, quote, each particular activity prepares the way for the activity that follows. These form not a mere succession, but a series. The seriated quality of life activities is affected through the delicate balance of the complex factors in each particular activity. When the balance within a given activity is disturbed, when there is a proportionate excess or deficit in some factor, then there is exhibited need, search, and fulfillment or satisfaction in the objective meanings of those terms. This clarifies Dewey's statement in Qualitative Thought, where he writes, quote, there is nothing intellectual or logical in contiguity in mere juxtaposition in space and time. If association were then either of or by contiguity, association would not have any logical force, any connection with thought. To be clear, contiguities as objects of inquiry necessarily have logical force. They have been brought into an ongoing serial relation. Dewey's claim is that pre-existing and ongoing serial relations and not physical contiguities provide the bases for thought in general, and thus for the doubt that initiates inquiry, and for the free associations and anticipations that follow. Responsive action and meaningful growth towards closures and new beginnings transpires in coordination with a serial set of events. On a Deweyan picture, life, consciousness, experienced history, thinking, any meaningful set of interactions cannot be reduced to physically successive events upon which we superimpose meaning. We might, for certain purposes, emphasize physical contiguities when describing phenomena, but even a seemingly exhaustive set of such descriptions cannot tell the full story. This is one of the primary reasons why Dewey insisted on a metaphysics that studies non-causal generic traits as opposed to specialized science, which studies that which is particular, physical, and causal. Perception itself is an event that necessarily emerges from a serial matrix. In Art as Experience, Dewey insists that, and here's a longer quote, to see, to perceive, is more than to recognize. It does not identify something present in terms of a past disconnected from it. The past is carried into the present so as to expand and deepen the content of the latter. There is illustrated the translation of bare continuity of external time into vital order and organization of experience. Identification nods and passes on, or it defines a passing moment in isolation and marks a dead spot in experience that is merely filled in. The extent to which the process of living in any day or hour is reduced to labeling situations, events, and objects as so-and-so in mere succession marks the cessation of a life that is a conscious experience. Continuities realized in an individual discrete form are the essence of the latter. Mere succession reduces to the death of a conscious life. Consciousness is necessarily a serial continuity that is funded by roots that are proximal and superficial, as well as those that are deep and hidden away. When the past is carried into the present, here quoting Dewey from above, this is an immaterial set of relations that are nonetheless no less empirical than any race, R-E-S, that is able to be experienced. In Experience in Nature, Dewey also approaches the distinction between successions and serial relations through discussing the difference between temporal quality and temporal order. Here's quoting Dewey again, temporal quality is however not to be confused with temporal order. Quality is quality, direct, immediate, and undefinable. Order is a matter of relation, of definition, dating, placing, and describing. It is discovered in reflection, not directly had and denoted as is temporal quality. Temporal order is a matter of science. Temporal quality is an immediate trait of every occurrence, whether in or out of consciousness. Temporal order, as above characterized, is a logical or reflective determination, a selective delimiting and ordering that is identified in coordination with a particular inquiry. In positing a temporal order, there is a cognitive process of selection that is necessarily preceded by qualitative coherence. The final sentence of the above quote, that quote, quality is an immediate trait of every occurrence, whether in and out of consciousness, is a statement that is metaphysical in import, something that we will address in uh, the next section of this talk. It should be noted that it is incorrect on a Deweyan model to say that reflective thought is primarily responsible for the existence and recognition of serial relations. Moreover, it is incorrect to claim that, a serial, that serial relations or qualities cause perception. 
Dewey writes that, quote, when association takes on the form of thought or is controlled and not loose daydreaming, association is a name for a connection of objects or their elements in the total situation. The key phrasing here is association takes the form of thought. A form must be defined as a capacity had by all events to integrate into a specific and purposive experiential context or series of relations. They are hence the basis for meanings which can be defined as shared or public sign beliefs that emerge from matrices that are biological, cultural, and logical in orientation, where sign suggests inferential or proleptic e efficacy and belief indicates something actual and institutional. So to take on the form of thought is to accrue to the specific kinds of relations that are involved in active cognition. To take on the form of the kind of thinking that figures in inquiry, association manifests in symbolization, inference, propositions, and judgments. But the bigger picture is this. Associating or cohering are processes that precede thought. Coherence is there, a raw pervading race, an immaterial concretization of events that can take on different forms through which it is transfigured. It is thus not thought that gives original shape to association, but rather association provides the grounds for thought and the pre-reflective association in a total situation is in every way continuous with the varied forms of individuated reflection. This, I believe, is the way in which we must discuss logical continuity, at least on a Deweyan model. In sum, the aspect of association that we may term coherence is a serial relation, a series of events that purposely transpires towards some fruitage. Given the proper conditions, association may take on the form of thinking. In this way, logical traits are ontologically continuous with and logically inseparable from their underlying qualitative matrices. Suggestivity, the second function of qualities qua grounds of association, names the qualitative as it emerges through some disturbance or conflict in connection with conscious life, but not necessarily cognitive thought or inquiry. Suggestivity involves a variety of related events to which the name synthesis, division, analogy, denotation, and identification may be given. While coherence describes qualitative association more generally, suggestivity describes specific modes of association and definition or delimitation as they evolve in coordination with a situation. Suggestivities are generative of the particular terms of active thinking, and they are distinctions that belong to the situation itself as opposed to being distinctions made on purely reflective grounds. Suggestivity occurs when the institutionalized factors of a situation, that which Dewey uh, terms habit among them, enter into attentional relation with a novel development, perhaps an emerging need, yielding doubt that is, as Dewey insists, part of the situation itself. Suggestivity thus coincides with the inception of an indeterminate situation, or what, what Dewey terms an indeterminate uh, situation. Dewey writes, quote, Without the resistant or negative factor, there would be no tension to affect the change from a direct response to an immediate act to an indirect one, a distinct object of thought. Here Dewey verges on using the negative in an analogous sense to Hegel, the presentiment of a future state of affairs where the presage itself is a productive force in bringing something into concrete existence. However we parse that term, it is through interqualitative conflict that we perceive, make analogies, mentally conjoin, distinguish, and identify objects. There is nothing in or of the object in its specificities that makes, enables, or suggests these distinctions. That work is the work of qualitative association. A judgment, a term that describes the settled outcome of any given logical operation, is the potential of a quality as it is actualized through reaching temporary fulfillment by way of reflective thought. I use this particular wording because it highlights the thoroughgoing continuity between qualities and the culminations of reflective thought. I also chose this particular phrasing because we might imagine other ways in which interqualitative conflicts might come to a close, ways that are not specifically driven by cognitive enterprise. Purpose of association, as we have seen, may take on the form of thought, but it can take on other forms. Cognition, after all, is only a small part of experience, an even smaller part of nature, and is not exclusive in its ability to create equilibrium in a conflicting environment. This leads us to a further topic, 
the question as to whether it is possible to discuss qualities apart from the situated context of inquiry. In naturalistic metaphysics, Dewey writes, is bound to consider reflection itself as a natural event occurring within nature because of the traits of the latter. What are these tensional traits that allow for the processes that are specific to reflective thought? In experience in nature, qualities are among the traits Dewey calls generic to existence. But Dewey does little to give this claim any definite shape and does, not e and does even less in explicitly connecting qualities as metaphysical traits to the qualitative backdrop of inquiry. If we are to provide some clarity and precision where Dewey himself did not, the, the best strategy is to generalize qualitative association as it functions within inquiry in order to see what this might look like uh, in a much broader context, that ultimate context Dewey calls nature. Before doing this, it will be useful to consider some basic ideas from Dewey's metaphysics that, while stated clearly enough by Dewey himself, are often either condemned or overlooked entirely by his interpreters. In 1915, Dewey stated that generic traits of existence are, quote, found equally and indifferently whether a subject matter in question be dated 1915 or 10 million years ago BC. Accordingly, they would seem to deserve the name of ultimate or irreducible traits. Later in 1925, Dewey writes that generic traits are, quote, ineluctable traits of natural existence. He never calls them generic traits of experience. He only uses the term, the phrase, generic traits of existence. It would seem that generic traits are necessarily attributes of all existences and that these traits obtain independent of context. The confusion, I believe, stems from other remarks that Dewey makes, such as, quote, the only a uh, thing which is constant is change, and that, quote, what exists are things acting and changing. The conundrum may, however, be resolved easily enough. Dewey is careful to distinguish between the particular and the generic. In 1948, he writes, this genuine subject matter, metaphysics, is the fact that the natural world has generic as well as specific traits, and that in the one case, as in the other, experience is such as to enable us to arrive at their identification. When we discuss particular events, such as the French language or the formation of a planet, we can ask questions about causal relations and causal origins. Such questions are simply not within the domain of metaphysics. Metaphysical inquiry concerns non-causal traits that are universally operative. The traits, while remaining constant in their general character and function, manifest differently in each context. Whether they are particular or generic, traits can be discussed as processes, but the processes of particular traits have origins and termini, and generic traits do not. The distinction that Dewey makes between operations and processes may be useful in understanding the difference. Dewey writes that an operation, being a relation, is not a process. Operations are, quote, connective interactions that are uniform. They are the general tendencies or patterns of interaction. Thus, we might think of generic traits as generic operations, indicating a set of basic patterns or tendencies, a movement about an axis, to borrow some language from how we think right there, that is captured by Dewey's archetypical generic trait, the precarious and stable. The term process, then, as distinguished from operation, belongs to individuated things. Processes are, quote, local and temporal particular. Let us now return to qualities and ask what it would mean to call qualitative relations generic traits of existence. We have to do some speculative work here. We have seen that qualities account for the basic connections or coherence among logical existences and operations. In other words, they're the basis for logical continuity. If we generalize this function, we must speak of a naturalistic coherence or continuity. To call nature a continuous whole is only to claim, I think on a Deweyan uh, Dewey picture, that all existences may potentially interact with one another. To be clear, this does not indicate that all things are interacting or will someday interact. Uh, it just means that there necessarily exists a potential for interaction, and this potential is the fundamental basis for continuity. While we may make the claim that all things may potentially interact, this does not and cannot indicate that all things may engage in successions. 
That is, not all existences are capable of physical contiguity, at least not according to the principles of a radical empiricism or any non-materialistic ontology. Thus, the potential to engage in causal successions is not one that is generic to existence. The potential to engage in a serial relation, however, is one that is universal. I have above stated that all existences may potentially interact with one another. We can easily enough rephrase this in the language of qualities. All existences may potentially engage in serial relations with one another. To call quality generic to existence is to claim that existences have this potential. Within the circumscribed process of active thinking, the reality of potentially most concretely manifests as a set of anticipations that modify and guide the trajectory of inquiry. On a much broader level, nature anticipates in coordination with that which is already in place. Were this not the case, there would be no instrumental value to the anticipations that occur on the level of conscious experience, for there would be no continuity and thus no genuine transactions between these occurrences and the natural world. The tools would be unsuited for their materials. Insofar as serial relations are purposive, we can now speak of a natural purposiveness that obtains beyond the particularities of situated inquiry. Nature has purposes, not of course purpose in the traditional sense of ascribing to nature uh, predetermination or human-like agency, but only in the sense that natural events, whether relevant or not to human experience and need, move towards beginnings and endings in coordination with some potential release of energies, fulfillment, or consummation. So far, I have generalized the function of coherence. The other function, the last thing I'm going to do here, of qualities that I have above termed suggestivity also has metaphysical import. Suggestivity, as we have seen, emerges through a series of conflicts among existences and is harnessed in active thinking through a sense of indeterminacy and doubt. On the metaphysical level, suggestivity is no longer a suitable name for this function. Here, we must speak of the oppositional conjoinment of individuality and constant relations. All generic traits are oppositional. The and that separates precarious and stable is not a conjunction that joins two separate or separable things. It stands for an oppositional relation. Dewey's philosophy, in fact, centers about such oppositional relations as they manifest in particularities. Uh, things like organism and environment, actual and potential, means and ends, habit and impulse, stimulus and response, analysis and synthesis, biological and cultural, active and passive, assertability and warrant, continuous and discrete, deductive and inductive, deliberation and choice, empirical and normative, focus and context, form and matter, process and product, relation and individuation, description and narration, theory and practice, and so on and so forth. The list can just go on and on here. These exchanges Manifesting qualitative operations within localized contexts all follow what Dewey calls the rhythms of nature or the generic schema of rhythmic change. Dewey asserts that polarity or opposition of energies, this is here quoting Dewey, is everywhere necessary to the definition of the delimitation that resolves an otherwise uniform mass and expands into individual forms at the same time. The ballast distribution of opposite energies provides the measure or order which prevents variation from becoming a disordered heterogeneity. Moreover, Dewey will insist that, quote, delimitation or individualization is not external to events. It is one with the organization which permeates them and which, in permeating them, converts prior limitations of intensity and direction of energy into actual and intrinsic qualities or sentient differences. To call quality generic to existence is to simultaneously attribute a tension between relation and individuation to all existences. The things comprising a continuous relational series are at no point wholly individual or discrete. Every existence, Dewey writes, in addition to its qualitative and intrinsic boundaries, has affinities and active outreachings for connection and intimate union. Relation in tension with individuation is constitutive of what a thing most fundamentally is. This is a qualitative conjoinment. In sum, to call quality a generic trait of existence is to name the unchanging fact that phenomena are continuous insofar as they may serial, serially relate. To call a relation qualitative is to name the basic capacity to exist by way of an individuating tendency in tension with a tendency towards relations. While these capacities are unchanging features of nature, the universe is capable of constantly producing novel elements, and generic traits are ultimately those features of nature that make their emergence 
possible. I'll stop there. So thank you. So I'll ask the first question. Um, there's, I don't know if you've looked at, but um, I, I hear it um, in some of the Dewey quotes you presented and his ideas of his essay on Peirce's idea of firstness as quality. And you didn't bring it up, you didn't even you didn't bring up Peirce, mm -hmm. which is fine because you're doing a kind of interpretive effort on Dewey, but I want to bring it up. <laughs> and, and the reason why is because um, because you're seeing some Peirce here. Well, you, yeah, obviously, yeah. yeah. And because, like, I read him a lot and, you know, he's on my mind. <laughs> this came up in Columbus, too, mm -hmm. in this question session. So yeah. Have you read that? Yeah. Yeah, I don't want to do that. I hate that move. Yeah. <clears throat> like, go read this because it'll, you know, get, throw that out and just read Peirce and then we'll be okay. That was also said. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm that? not saying that. I am. <laughs> oh, only. Oh, really? Um, only by him. <laughs> All right, so to get to my point, um, it, we, this, is it you, when, we, when, we, when you talk about quality um, as a ground, as a metaphysical ground for logical operations, you come back to often the idea of quality as a pervasive element of experience, mm -hmm. um, and I would think also of reality, because um, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. so it's this relational and this continuous facet of quality that you want to discuss and that's something Dewey latches onto with regard to Peirce's phenomenology of firstness in that essay I mentioned that's why I brought mm -hmm. it up um, but Peirce also talks about quality as as a stasis um, which doesn't seem to be going on with Dewey mm -hmm. um, and I wonder where you see that fitting in to uh, to logic being Grounded on a stasis, on a stasis. Yeah, on quality, as in feelings and experiential qualities like colors and noises mm -hmm. and sounds, and uh, the ripping toothache that person yeah. describes. Right. So this, there's a plurality of positive, sui generis qualities to existence mm -hmm. for purpose, and that's in you know not a and not a reducible to a human experience but because first wants to broaden this to a greater metaphysical mm -hmm. view but nonetheless a kind of aesthetic right element going on there mm -hmm. to his view of quality so mm -hmm. do we want to focus on the relational aspect but do you see a, a that element as also foundational to logic I, I i don't know if i'd call that kind of determinations that are qualitative, um, foundational to um, anything in the logic, um, but I would say that they're continuous. So when we determine, when we're able to get to that point of looking at sort of individual things or people or works of art, right, and say it kind of even feel a quality or say it has this kind of quality or even something like sweetness or redness, um, I would say that's continuous with much broader things, but I think that for me, uh, when we say that qualities are the bases for logical operations, we just have to say, what, how, how is it that we're um, entering into a situation where there are associations, where there's a kind of conjoinment between all these diverse factors moving towards some sort of uh, consummation, or at least we're hopeful that it moves towards this, right, and some sort of uh, restoration of equilibrium. And I, I, I think that as a ground of inquiry, we have to be really careful to uh, discuss qualities in a very general way, which just is to say that they allow things distant in space and time to interact. And then it's from that point that we are uh, able to uh, say things about phenomena. Um, I think without bringing in the kind of ineliminable subjectivity that we get um, in so many um, accounts, even of pragmatism, when people talk about this kind of, uh, we can't escape our sort of human, you know, perspective that we can't see the world from a God's eye point of view. You hear this kind of repeated. Um, there's, of course, beauty in that, and there's some truth to that. But at the same time, that seems to reaffirm this kind of subject-object relation that, that Dewey didn't want. So I, I think that 
one of the uh, good things about thinking of quality in this way is it allows us to talk about our continuity with the objects of reflection and get away from this kind of ineliminable subjectivity that is, you know, reaffirmed by things like, again, the, this kind of humble fallibilism. It's reaffirmed by um, the constructivists who say, you know, ontological boundaries are social constructs. It's reaffirmed by somebody like Philip Kitcher, who's going to say, you know, um, that when we have successfully completed some sort of action or inquiry, it's because there's been a successful relationship between, you know, uh, things going on in our mind and things out there in the world. Um, I, I think that this, this very strongly refutes all of those conceptions of what logic is doing or inquiry is doing in pragmatism, and that's why I, I would keep those grounds as kind of at that very general level. Yeah, sure. So, uh, your paper's terrific. So let's argue about Dewey, not your paper. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Can... All right, let me rephrase it this way. Is thought responsible for there being qualities? No. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> now, is thought responsible for modifying the qualitative aspect of situations? It's not the only thing that does that, but it contributes. But if thought wouldn't, if thought weren't there, mm -hmm. well, nothing interesting would happen. So, careful. I'm not is thought during inquiry responsible for modifying qualities? Qualities. That was in your paper. You you asserted that. Well, judgment has to issue from yeah. a modification of the quality. Mm -hmm. So thought is responsible for quality then. No, because when we're if we're, if we're talking about a situation, or if we're talking about thought, I think those things for Dewey are going to be kind of inseparable, right? You can't get really get your situation or how he's using the term. Maybe things like situations, I'm not sure, but you can't really get what he's using in a kind of technical way, situation, without um, some sort of thought happening. And, and how I'm kind of viewing this in relation to the big picture is that a situation or, or a particular inquiry is a kind of refinement. It's a very... Um, guided, it's a very careful refinement, in fact, of these broader naturalistic energies and uh, however we want to describe these patterns um, and, and phenomena and these raw materials, as Dewey sometimes likes to put it, of nature. It's refining these materials in a very careful uh, way. And so does it, does it make qualities? Well, in the sense of taking some um, materials that were kind of there, allowing for association and, and suggestion, and transfiguring them such that it resolves something, I would say, yes, we're co-creating them, um, certainly, in a, in a logical and ontological sense. So thought sense. is responsible for qualities, at least interesting ones to us. It's, I wouldn't say that. I would say that thought helps further refine qualities and directions that fulfill needs for us, but I wouldn't say that it's going to be um, you, you know, a refinement, right, doesn't really create the entire thing. It kind of just shapes it in that end phase. But the qualities are different after thought does its work. Oh, absolutely, yeah. So there is a degree of responsibility. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I think yeah, that's all I was asking. Oh, okay, yeah. So thought is both re not responsible and responsible for the qualitative aspects of situations during ongoing activity. Yeah, in that sense, yes, it co-creates uh, quality. You can understand why he drove the idealists and the realists nuts. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because each one saw the right. other position mm -hmm. in that's Dewey. Right. In other words, mm -hmm. Dewey was viewed as an idealist because, of course, we're constantly modifying existence mm -hmm. with thought, as your paper eloquently affirms. Mm -hmm. Eloquently. Mm -hmm. Not briefly, but eloquently, right, at length, as you give excellent answers. And thought has to be responsive to the given. There is given. We need to stop talking about Dewey as if, you know, he was an anti-given. There's given all over the place. Yeah, absolutely. The given, thought cannot create the associations that are pre-given, mm -hmm. right, in the holes. The holes are there. 
Whether Paul's a huge fan of the Whether given. thought, there's a huge <laughs> fan of the given. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's a question of what do you do with the given. So the qualitative has to be operating at the level of thirdness, it seems to me. There's no firstness or secondness going on with Dewey's notion of the qualitative. Maybe it's all a tiny it's bit of tertiary. Tiny, tiny bit, bit of secondness. Of secondness. Tiny no, bit of secondness. No, no firstness. There's no firstness. <laughs> no, no firstness. Because right, I that's how that. experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's how nice. experience yeah. is embedded in existence. Is, that's why the two overlap. Uh, <laughs> okay. Thank you. So if you agree that the qualitative is simultaneously luring thought on mm-hmm. into further hidden associations for which thought cannot be responsible. Mm -hmm. I'm with you, and I think Dewey has an intelligible uh, understanding of how inference can go where nature lures it. Because Dewey needs to have it both ways. He has to have thought not responsible for existence, and yet thought has got to be responsible for lived existence, not lived experience, right? Mm -hmm. Because that makes it too subjective. Mm-hmm. Right. So at any rate, I just thought this might, you know, dialectically help some folks sort of grappling mm-hmm. with how qualities have to face both ways, just as experience does. And that's like the right. Yeah. Creativity about that. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. The third yeah. Yeah. But great paper. Thank you. Andy? Yeah, well, I know Jared. Had, Jared wrote a master's thesis on this problem, and so <laughs> I know he's got something to say. But my question does does relate to this general prob, uh, problem. Uh, in Dewey, uh, and uh, uh, I, I have a very, how should I put it, not, not I don't give the usual answer um, uh, for Dewey to these questions, but I will say, and, and do say, that I don't think Dewey ever modified his postulate of immediate empiricism. I think he put it down and stuck with it for the rest of his life. Mm-hmm. And what that means is that the problem of immediacy um, that, that just so vexed everyone in the 19th century. The problem of immediate experience, and you might say firstness <laughs> as well, um, is, is something Dewey says, you know what, I don't think we're going to get anywhere with this. But the way you read qualitative thought, it's like you're reaching back in the direction of undoing the postulate of immediate empiricism. Say, no, Dewey actually does have some kind of an account of immediacy um, uh, in, in the qualitative thought essay. I looked at that essay up and down, back and forth to make sure that he hadn't taken back uh, the postulate of immediate empiricism. And I'm satisfied he didn't, but I want to hear what you think. I'm not sure that he, that he took it back. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm not saying he did, but, but you talk like this is going to do the work of firstness. I think that I think that he he developed uh, a more sophisticated way of talking about experience. Yeah, that's that's what I would say too. And I, I think that you know by the time you know you have to think of this is you know starting in the the um, you know like 1930s qualitative thought right. Uh-huh. He already had his metaphysics down. I know we disagree. You and I disagree about the relevance of this, but I I think you know here in something like experience in nature, he develops a very nuanced uh, idea of what experience is. And what I think that people talking about do we get wrong is they want to kind of <coughs> reduce it down to either this kind of, you know, either precognitive or cognitive. It's a little more nuanced than that, right? It's, he talks about the functionalities of experience on a level that is cultural, on the level that is mind, that is a, as a system of meanings. He talks about it on the level of the subconscious, of consciousness, and, and then finally of cognitive thought. And I think there we have to develop a more um, sophisticated idea of what it, how something becomes immediate to us mm-hmm. by considering all of those kinds of uh, wellsprings from which we, we draw things, and they become um, it, such that they can be, be immediate. But I, I don't think he ever. Um, I think that. I mean, I think the postulate essay was really the beginning of his mature philosophy, and I think it's it's compatible with everything. Just like I think everything he said in the in, in his logic work from 1903 is compatible with things he said in 1938. I just think it was developed in a more sophisticated way. But it's all. But the point is, it all remains descriptive metaphysics, and uh, and so in other words, there isn't. Sometimes I sometimes I feel like you're trying to make 
of Dewey, somebody who does something more than descriptive metaphysics, somebody who's uh, somebody who has uh, insight into the immediacies. Uh, and, and the way you talk about existence in particular is, is this is the one that, it had, that's the moment where I'm sitting there going, uh-oh, um, this isn't descriptive metaphysics anymore. This, this is, oh wait, what's his name? This is Hegel. Uh, I thought it was medieval. Existence well, it is. Essence. It is. I mean, I you but were putting, uh, actually, experience for essence in I mean, existence. I, I think I think he's going to confess to using the word existence sometimes in the way that Hegel does. Because there's Paul in this. This isn't all Dewey. Yeah, but there's Dewey there's in this Churlin too. In this. <laughs> and Dewey was a student of Hegel. And what did <laughs> what what I think Dewey got out of Hegel most of all, right? Because you can get hung up on all kinds of things. But I think it's, it's actually quite simple. Um, the biggest influence from Hegel was the idea that there are, that these dyadic pairings run through nature. And that Hegel, at his best, gives naturalistic accounts of this. He says, when we talk about the movement of planets or, or, or you know, any, any of these natural events, it's because of the fr sort of frictions that, you know, frictions make things go. Um, and I think that this is such a <coughs> core part of how Dewey saw the world um, that even when he's going to be talking about generic traits, he's going to say that they have to be these patterns uh, that are sort of dialectical, not to insert that word there, but no, you know, they are you're dialectical they are. patterns. They are. Dewey's a dialectical thinker at, uh, at bottom. Yeah. Larry made me change the title of that master's thesis, Randy. <laughs> <laughs> so as not to include dialectical and John Dewey in the there same phrase. Go. So, I'm go. just throwing that out the there. The Hegel lecture was in the 1800s. <laughs> <laughs> We're at oh, we're at, oh, so oh, we better. Well, thank you, well, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.